on communion Sundays, we like to focus on singing about the blood of Jesus Christ because it is that blood that paid the atonement for our sin. Did you know, like, for instance, imagine if you would, this is a horrible example, but just imagine the worst sewer you could imagine. The worst sewer, sewage. Now imagine it in 110 degree weather. Exactly. Now, on our most righteous day, that is how our natural sin lifts up to God. We are horribly putrid. But through the blood of Christ, through the blood of Jesus, we are cleansed. God filters it through Jesus. He looks at him and accepts us and loves us. That is worth celebrating, right? If you're willing and able, would you stand this morning? We're going to sing about the blood. Dear God, thank you so much for the blood of Jesus Christ who paid the price for our sins that we might be accepted in your presence and approach, as the book of Hebrews says, the throne of God, the mercy seat. Dear Lord, we ask that you help us to respond in worship today, to be molded and shaped to look more like Jesus. In your name we pray. We all say amen. Amen. One, two, one, two, three. Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood?
Welcome to Bellevue this morning. We're glad you guys are, uh, are, are here. If you're visiting with us, you should have a bulletin, and in that bulletin is a connection card. If you would fill that out. If you're a first-time guest, please let that be the only thing you put in the offering plate you're special to us. Now, also, this morning, you guys remember that, um, that uh, website we sent you to that one time where you took all the... Uh, Adam's supposed to do this. I'm sorry. I can't remember how it goes. Is, he, is Adam in the room? Hey, come on up, man. I didn't want to throw you into the bus, but I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, all right, now, we took you to a website. We took you to bellevue.owensboro.org, or you got on our, our uh, app, and then you answered ridiculous questions about ice cream, cake, and I don't remember what else. Now we have a serious question. So if you, sometime this morning, get on there, um, you'll find a question that is asking you, if you had one Big question that you could ask God, just one, what would it be? And perhaps, maybe you might see a sermon about it in July some about, somewhere whereabouts. So, um, it's, it's got some value to it. Um, also, then, if you're a guest and you take the tear off uh, this morning and you fill all that out, we'd love to know that you are here. Uh, we have a gift for you. Uh, we have um, a, a book that we'd like you to have out in the atrium in the guest services area. If you could go and grab that after the service as well. And now, if you would just uh, greet the people who are around you. All right, as you uh, make your way back to your seat, go ahead and have a seat. And uh, may I direct your attention to the baptistry. It is my distinct privilege to uh, welcome into the waters of baptism today, Kiera, Kiera Cunningham. One more step. Kiera, are you trusting in Jesus and in Jesus alone for your salvation? Well then, Kiera, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Would you join me in prayer? We thank you so much for Kier's precious faith in you. We thank you, dear Lord, that she has trusted in Christ and Christ alone for the forgiveness of her sins and for entrance into the kingdom of God. Lord God, we pray that you would use her family and also, dear Father God, our church to be an encouragement to her as she grows in her faith and learns to walk as a disciple of Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Uh, about ten and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, write a hymn arrangement for, um, a, which is a new harmonization and a new chorus for the old hymn "He Leadeth Me." And um, when I was writing it, I, I realized there's a problem with the words. It has words we don't know what they mean, or <laughs> we don't sing very often, like "murmur" and "repine." Uh, I don't know how many times you guys go around using the word "repine." I don't. Um, but in the context of the hymn, that phrase, murmur and repine, means uh, a sourly spoken discontent. And the author of the lyrics is actually describing his desire to never be discontent with God's leading, which I think is a hard phrase to sing honestly. Um, so, spiritual contentment. Um, <clears throat> without faith, it says in Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please God. So I believe that spiritual contentment is a product of maturing 
faith. And for those of you who have sought God earnestly for any length of time in your life, you've most likely encountered what I would call a test of faith or multiple tests of faith. And the book of James tells us that God is not the author of temptation. So it's not temptation to sin. A, a test is a clear choice between something that you want and something that God wants. And you have to choose. Because choosing yourself means serving yourself, self-preservation or self-advancement, or serving God, which might mean taking a back seat and maybe counter productive. So God will create these circumstances in your life where you must choose to yield to him no matter the cost. Listen to Isaiah 55. Indeed, my plans are not your plans and my deeds are not your deeds. For just as the sky is higher than the earth, so my deeds are superior to your deeds and my plans superior to your plans. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Of course, we all have this one memorized, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and what? Do not rely on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. God's plan is to grow our faith each time we choose to trust God over our own self-preserving instincts. So, as we continue to worship this morning... Let's let this phrase, Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine, content whatever lot I see, since tis thy hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. <coughs> A faithful servant I will be, tis by thy hand he leadeth me, paraphrased. I would like that for to be a, a, a prayer, because I know it's not an honest truth, but it can be a yearning of our heart, right? We can make it a, a prayer. You guys continue to be seated. We would ask that you would, uh, you would sing along with us.
And to worship the living Lord is something that is only privileged to us because of the shed blood of Christ. There's no way that unrighteous sinners such as us could, could face a holy God in true worship and connection apart from the atoning sacrifice of Christ washing away our sins. And so today we celebrate our occasion to worship by partaking of the Lord's Supper that reminds us that it is by the shed blood of Jesus that we are saved and brought into right relationship with Almighty God. And as we prepare for this Lord's Supper, it is imperative that we examine our hearts. The Apostle Paul taught the church to prepare for the partaking of the Lord's Supper in a specific way. I read to you what he says. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup that supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, Paul writes, therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Paul is very clear that the expectation is that we would prepare our hearts before partaking of the Lord's Supper. Now let me make something very clear. Paul is not saying that unworthy people cannot partake of the Lord's Supper. Before the living God, we are all sinners unworthy of salvation. The Bible says that we're not to approach the table in an unworthy manner. But if you're an unworthy sinner, by all means, partake of the Lord's Supper. But don't do it in an unworthy manner. And an unworthy manner would be to partake of the Lord's Supper as if the Lord's Supper was a, eh, no big deal. Or as if you didn't need Jesus and His saving grace in order to approach God. That would be to approach this table in vain. And there would be guilt upon you. But by all means, if you're a sinner broken in your spirit in need of the grace of God, by all means, partake of the Lord's Supper. All who have accepted Christ and been baptized in His name are invited to partake of the Lord's Supper today. But prepare your heart for it. Examine yourself. Is there any unconfessed sin in your life? Confess it to Him before you partake. Is there any pride in your heart that has deluded you into thinking 
that you don't need Jesus. Confess that. And come to the Lord for His hand of grace. And if you come humbly and repentant, reaching for His mercy, depending on His grace, you, though you are unworthy before God, you will be coming in a worthy manner, recognizing that His shed blood makes you worthy before God. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you to partake of the Lord's Supper. May we indeed not come in an unworthy manner, but in a manner of great reverence, humility, and repentance. Recognizing by faith that it is Jesus and Jesus alone that has died for our sins and that he is enough to make us right before you, O Father God. Lord, we pray right now that this would be a most meaningful time of coming to you, of recognizing your grace in our life and our dependence on you. In Jesus' name, amen. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring my soul will trust in him no other my soul is satisfied in him more. as the summer flowers we fade and die fame youth and beauty Eternal calls to us at the cross. I will not boast in wealth or might, or human wisdom's fleeting light, but I will boast in.
now if our ushers would come forward as we prepare to take the offering, would you pray with me? Father God, we come before you right now and we thank you that you have given us your very son, Jesus, on the cross to pay for our sins and make us right with you. You have given us our lives. You have given us eternal life in Jesus. And you have provided for us provision for this earth. And Lord, we thank you for what you've generously given to us. And as we return our tithes and offerings to you in obedience, but also with joy, we thank you for the privilege of being able to participate in the ongoing advancement of your gospel and your kingdom locally and throughout the world. We thank you, dear Father God, that in pooling together our tithes and offerings and giving them to you, we're able to coordinate a ministry that touches places all over the planet. And we thank you especially, dear Father, how it will touch the lives of many through Vacation Bible School this very week. We pray that many kids would come to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord because your people were faithful to give, to volunteer, and to strive that those children might know Christ. Lord God, continue to do a work in us as we give to you. In Jesus' name, amen. you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you would turn to Matthew chapter 12, we'll start in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 12, continue on in our series Against the Grain. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1, and Matthew records, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what, it, what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, 
Something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him? He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have had together this morning, Lord, to worship you, to have that great appetizer, Lord, for the great wedding feast of the Lamb that we desire to share with you in all eternity. Lord, we pray now that your word would be heard your Holy Spirit would rest upon our ears, and that, Lord, that you would speak for your servant, that it would be your words and not mine, that it would be your word that is clear, that it is concise, that, Lord, that it would be proclaimed boldly for the point of your name and your glory going forward, and for that those who are in this place, Lord, to take what it is that they hear and what it is that they know about you and proclaim it to the ends of the earth. And so, Lord, may we be faithful And Lord, we know that you are, for you have purchased this very time with your very own blood. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are desperately weary people. There's lots of times where we are exhausted. We are beat down. We use other synonyms for it, like tired, which encompasses some of what it means to be weary. But in being weary... There are many things in this life that just continue to to add up as time goes on. For example, as you get older, each and every year as it goes on, thank you, sir, each and every year as, as life goes on, sin and its effects, it builds up not just in our bodies itself, but the weariness we have in watching it. For ourselves, for our loved ones, for other ones, we get tired of seeing things get destroyed. We, we get tired of seeing things get broken. We get tired of seeing pain and hurt in other people. It, it builds up as time goes on. We, we get weary, and it, and it forms in us a, a few types of what I would call effects of it. We, we get anxious. We get depressed. It, it, it wears us down. We see it all the time, and we desire for this to be away from us. We, we, we do not want it near us. And so we desire rest. And the problem is, is we have, no, we have no means, we have no ability of knowing how to get rest. And, and just to be clear, I'm not talking about sleep. Although sleep uh, has, is an effect, I would say, of being a restful person, one who has rest. Sleep is not the goal that we're looking at. So again, interruption of rest is not for, say, someone who gets up at 2 a.m. to eat cinnamon Oreos in the middle of the night and drink milk. Not that I know anyone who does this. Or as I've explained to my kids, there's a sweet tooth that grows in my mouth sometime around 2 a.m. and then it disappears magically after this, to which they said they want to get up and they want to see it. And I said, no. (laughs) It just goes away though. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about that type of interruption of rest, of sleep. We're talking about the type of rest that can be afforded to us only in the type of rest that God himself takes. And it's what he did on the seventh day. He rested. He rested from his creative acts to spend time with us. We who are made in his image. 
He rested so his creation could enjoy him. He rested so that his creation could glorify him, enjoy him forever, and so that we then, seeing the beauty of God and his creative abilities, and thus using these creative abilities that he has given to us, use them for the restoration and to make beautiful his creation and his image itself. And so then, the question, can we give ourselves rest? Go ahead and we answer it already is no, and so how do we get it? And this is what we see in the, in the text before us, what Jesus is talking about when he shows that the Sabbath is here for kingdom work. And as they're going through the grain fields, the disciples are hungry and they're, they're picking grain heads off and they're eating it. And the, the Pharisees are rubbing their hands together and always looking for a way to try and nail Jesus to the wall of doing something wrong. And they go, there it is. Look what you're doing. That's wrong. It's so wrong, and not only is it wrong, it's on the Sabbath. It's super wrong. And he looks at them, and he, he says, have you not read? Now, you're going to hear Jesus say this a couple of times here in this passage, and he's provoking the Pharisees by doing this, because of all people on earth for Jesus to ask the question, have you not read? He would be asking the very people who are supposed to and do have all this memorized in their head. And so what an insulting question for him to look at them and go, have you not read? Have you not read? And then they would look back at him indignantly going, how in the world would you be asking this question to us? And he looks at him and he says, have you not read? What did David do when he was hungry? And so he tells them that David goes and eats the bread of the presence, which isn't lawful for him to eat, nor for what was it lawful for those who were with him. And he, he tells them, essentially, that David himself trumps the temple in the presence bread. He uses at the end, he, he, he's going to sum up this passage, right? This little, this little passage in the first eight verses by telling him a favorite Old Testament verse that Jesus likes to use over and over again. Hosea 6.6, 6, that God desires covenantal love. He doesn't desire sacrifice or burnt offerings. He desires mercy. And so he tells them then that the Sabbath is about life. And it's about mercy. And so it's better to eat the showbread and to live and, and than to not eat the showbread and then for David and his companions to die. But of course, they would look at him and say, but you're not David. You're Jesus. Who are you? Yeah, maybe David gets a special like, exemption because he's king and he's a man after God's own heart. But who are you, Jesus? And Jesus continues then, well... Have you not read? Again, fingernails on the chalkboard. He's digging in. And he says to him, the priests, the priests themselves, they profane the Sabbath just by performing the, te the temple rites on the Sabbath, just for walking in there. And he's, he's quoting back to them Numbers 28, 9 and 10, where they had to go and they had to sacrifice a young male lamb that was without a blemish for the priests to go in there. They, each, they had to sacrifice two of them. And he says that they have to do this because they are sinners, because they're profaners of the Sabbath. And yet, they would be held guiltless. They, God wouldn't strike them dead. And he says to them, so if you know all of God's word so well, and you understand the Sabbath so well, then I, I tell you that something greater than the temple's here. And if you understood that, then you would know what I say when I quote Hosea 6.6, 6, and I tell you that God desires mercy. God desires covenantal love. God desires a heart that is like his. For then you would not have condemned the guiltless. And then kind of the kapow, he hits him at the end there. He says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the boss. I made the Sabbath, is what he tells them. You want, he's turning the question around on them, and he's like, you want to sit here and question me about what I do on the Sabbath when I made the Sabbath. Hmm, that's interesting. You claim to know the word when I am the word. Again, interesting. I'm Lord of the Sabbath. But Jesus, being excellent, at teaching, he doesn't just leave things with the words, but he, he's going to back them up with deeds. And so that he moves on, and then he, he goes, and he enters their synagogue, and there's a man with a withered hand. 
And, and you notice that the man with the withered hand is just mentioned, and then he's dropped for a moment. It's just, hey, there's a dude with a withered hand there. And then they go after him again, and they ask him a question. So, is it lawful? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, keep in mind, he's already said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. And now they're asking him, is, is, is it lawful? Because they're, they're not lo- really understanding, listening to what he's saying. Back in Matthew 11.27 from last week, he says that um, all things have been handed over to me by the Father. And then he'll tell us in Matthew 28.18, he's going to say that all things have been given unto him. He's the boss, he's the Lord, and he's the son of man coming in the clouds in Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. And so he has all the same authority and lordship over the Sabbath as God did at creation. And and so it is his rules, it's his decisions about what's appropriate on the Sabbath and what rules that day and not the Pharisees. And he always knew what he had in mind for what what the Sabbath was to entail, what it was meant to be. And so then he, in turn, asks them a question back, and he says, okay, well, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Why would you take the sheep and lift it out on the Sabbath? Why are you not going to leave it in a pit for a whole day? A wolf, a bear, something's going to come and get it. It could die. It could be injured, right? And he says, what then? How much more value is a man than a sheep? So now, not only is he now comparing the Pharisees to sheep, and in turn all of us to sheep, so we're not very smart animals, so there's also an implication to that that we need a shepherd. We need someone who can pull us out of the pit. But to go even further, then, he says, let me show you what I mean. Enter back the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. The man stretches it out and he's healed. And so he tells them, have you not read? Have you not read? Do you not understand? Do you not see? Do you not know who I am? I'm greater than the temple and its rights. I am the embodiment of God's presence here on earth. Here I am. You need a shepherd. You do not understand what it is that you're supposed to do. And so he provokes them with this final move here by healing this man. Why is that provoking him to the Pharisees? Because the man's not in mortal danger. You know, the sheep is in mortal danger. Maybe David's in mortal danger of not eating. This man's not in mortal danger. In fact, in, is he not only in moral, not in mortal danger, but he has been uh, living his whole life this way, and he doesn't ask to be healed. Jesus just does it. He tells him, stretch out your hand, and he heals him. And so you get this foreshadowing of Jesus himself when he's going to stretch out his own hands when no one's asking him to, to heal, to show mercy, to shed his own blood on the cross. And the Pharisees are looking at him going, this guy could have been healed on any other day of the week. Why are you making it be done on the Sabbath? It's like you want to pick a fight with us, but he's not. He's showing them. Man is worth more than sheep. Sabbath is the perfect time to do this. It is the best time. It has to be now because the Sabbath is about glorifying God. It's about enjoying Him and seeing His mercy anew. And what better than to see this man who is the image of God have His hand restored to Him. To show the character of God on this very day where man is supposed to have all of his focus remembering what it is that He is made to do, the God that He is made to enjoy, the God who has gone to unbelievable lengths to save Him. And so what you see here is God is Jesus' continual showing of how restful he is. In other words, he's confident of what it is that he's supposed to do, no matter the questions that are coming after him, no matter the, the anger that is being stoked in the Pharisees. We see no rest in them. They're, they're, they're furious. They're mad. But he is doing exactly what it is that Matthew has said that he's come to do. He's come to fulfill the laws, Matthew says, in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. And the theme verse from Matthew, Matthew 1, 21, where it says that you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so he's come to fulfill the law so that he can save his people from their sins. And that law he's come to fulfill includes even the Sabbath. For he's telling them either your rest is found in me, 
or you better be perfect. Your rest is found in me. And if because you don't know your rest is found in me, you're not merciful. Because you don't know that your rest is found in me, you miss showing mercy to other people. You miss that he's Lord of the Sabbath. You miss who he is. And so then Matthew lays out Isaiah 42, 1 through 3, telling us about who Jesus is and what he has come to do. And he says he doesn't come to quarrel or cry, cry loud. He's not having this loud argument. He's not screaming back at the Pharisees. He's calm. The Pharisees are the ones losing their minds. He stays calm. And what does he do? He says he comes in a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench. He comes to be gentle with those who are bruised. He comes to speak gently, not to have far, fierce arguments. He's peaceful. He does this, but you, the people who he comes to have to know that this is their state, this is their case, this is where they are. And finally, he comes to bring justice to this world and hope to the Gentiles, and thus showing that the way justice is going to be brought to this world is either going to have to be on our own heads or it's going to have to be on his. And for him to be any hope for us at all, it's on his. Blaise Pascal is a famous mathematician and, and a Christian lived about 500 years ago and once said that men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. And we see this. The Pharisees are all over Jesus for healing a man and his disciples eating grain in a field and breaking the Sabbath. Why are they so worried about this? Because this is their objective, right? They think they're protecting the Sabbath. Without even understanding what the Sabbath is, they're out to protect it. That's the objective. And Jesus, you're messing it up. Why do they care? Well, they think that by adding to the law as they have done, that they are protecting the law. They think they are doing great work for God. But it's something they've created. Why? Because even though they, are, they think they're making things better, they're actually still just putting God in a box that they can understand so that they can think that they have control over everything. And so they say, if you don't do this, you don't do this, you don't do this, you do what we say, what makes us feel comfortable, then that'll be okay. But what's the problem? In their zeal to protect the Sabbath as they see it, what are they willing to give up? <laughs> well, they're willing to go and break commandments that you would think that they would be equally or more so wanting to protect. For example, like not plotting murder, not loving their neighbor. Maybe they should love their neighbor. And, and what for? All for their objective of what? Of nailing Jesus to the wall because he's messing with their objective. He's messing with their goal. He's messing with the whole worldview, the life that they've set up and the way it's been organized, the way they want it, even if the objective is ridiculous. Couldn't possibly have anything to do with God as he pushes back to them by saying, haven't you read? Not a very artsy person. I'm not somebody who usually understands art, poetry, things of this nature. It's not a gift that I have, but Wendell Berry is one of the few people that I can't understand. I think he's, because he's from Kentucky. Um, and so the, the way he writes is something that I can understand. The only, I, as I told the last service, the only thing that, that uh, could make it any better is if he was from Owensboro, then everything in there would be misspelled and I would understand it all the better. For all of you all have ever been to Shifley Park or Frederica or even Davis County for that matter. So, um, but he writes in a, in a book that he had called Sabbath Poems. He, he writes this poem and he says, Even while I dreamed, I prayed that what I saw was only fear and no foretelling, for I saw the last known landscape destroyed for the sake of the objective. The soil bludgeoned, the rock blasted. Those who had wanted to go home would never get there now. I visited the offices where for the sake of the objective, the planners planned at blank desks set in rows. I visited the loud factories where the machines were made that would drive ever forward toward the objective. I saw the forest reduced to stumps and gullies. I saw the poisoned river, the mountain cast into the valley. I came to the city that nobody recognized because it looked like every other city. I saw the passage worn by the unnumbered footfalls of those whose eyes were fixed upon the objective. 
their passing had obliterated the graves and the monuments of those who had died in pursuit of the objective and who had long ago forever been forgotten, according to the inevitable rule that those who have forgotten forget that they have forgotten. Men, women, and children now pursued the objective as if nobody had ever pursued it before. The races and the sexes now intermingled perfectly in pursuit of the objective. The once enslaved, the once oppressed, were now free to sell themselves to the highest bidder and to enter the best-paying prisons in pursuit of the objective, which was the destruction of all enemies, which was the destruction of all obstacles, which was the destruction of all objects, which was to clear the way to victory, which was to clear the way to promotion, to salvation, to progress, to the completed sale, to the signature on the contract, which was then to clear the way to self-realization, to self-creation, from which nobody who ever wanted to go home would ever get there now. For every remembered place had been displaced, the signposts had been bent to the ground and covered over. Every place had been displaced, every love unloved, every vow unsworn, every word unmeant, to make way for the passage of the crowd of the individuated, the autonomous, the self-actuated, the homeless with their many eyes open toward the objective for which they did not yet perceive in the far distance, having never known where they were going, having never known where they came from. How do we have rest? How do we have rest? <clears throat> In this world, we all have objectives, do we not, that we are constantly pursuing, that we are constantly after, and we play the game, if only, if only, if only, if only, if only I had a million dollars, if only I had another job, if only I get that promotion, if only my kids go to this college, if only my kids make this, if only I can do that, if only I were six inches taller, if only I could do this, right? And the bulk of these goals, what happens when we reach the objectives? They move on to what? Then the contract's signed, it's all done, and we say, oh, now I'm free to do what? To pursue the next objective that will leave us hollow, that will leave us empty, that will leave us unsatisfied. And we continually pursue these objectives over and over again because what do we hope is at the end of, of all of our objective seeking? Rest. Rest. But the problem is, is that we never find it. It's never there to be found. And what do we do? If I could just be a better mother, a better father, or have another job, lose a few pounds, idols all. Whose demands will never be met and whose appetites will never be satisfied. You'll feed them continuously, hoping that, that once you reach that objective, that, that all will finally come to peace and be as it should be, but it won't. And instead of the idols being delicate with you and your objectives bringing you peace, they bruise you, they break you. You don't believe it. Think about it. Look at your own life. Be honest about that which you hotly pursue. When you caught the very thing in life that you hoped to catch, was it rest? Or were you just on to the very next thing? This is the problem with life. It keeps going over and over and over again. You just, want you, you just want to get married. You want your first apartment. When you get your first apartment, you want your first house. When you want your first house, you want it fixed. And then you want to move into the next house. It keeps going. The objective is always something new that never brings you peace. And yet, this is how we fill our lives. And so the question then comes back to us as Jesus asked the Pharisees, have we not read? Does Jesus say, find yourself rest and then you will find me? Does he say, try harder, work for rest and there it will finally come. Work yourself to the bone for whatever objective it is that you think is going to finally allow you to be at peace. No. His assumption is what? That we're broken. That we're unable to come to any rest on our own. That's why he doesn't bruise. He doesn't break. He doesn't put out smoldering wicks. Our objectives throw cold water on our flame and they hit us right where we hurt the most. When we have no rest, we look just like these Pharisees, flailing, getting angry, desperately desiring to put our arms of control back around the very things that we have made, saying that's gonna be what does it, and we fight to no avail, to anxiety, to depression. 
all because we think that we need to be in control so that we can reach that objective. And in the meantime, we sacrifice the very thing that it is that we, our heart desires for, this rest, this peace. The only way that we can rid ourselves of a constant worry of maybe others are getting something more or better than we are or that we're not going to get that objective and that we can just be okay is to realize that our identity is not found in any of these objectives, but our identity is found in Christ. It's been the very thing that he dies to give to us that we get him. As JP said earlier, so we won't smell like sewers. <laughs> he, he gives this to us so that we can have rest. See, Jesus has rest because his identity is sure. He knows that he is Son of God, he comes to do, to show mercy. And it's only, you can only show mercy when you have this rest. You can't think of other people. You can't go out and do the things that you should do to show God, to show mercy. As he says that this is what he desires. You can't do it when all of your life is wrapped around your very own objective. When all you think about your own objective, you're never going to show mercy. So I have this week I was listening to a, uh, an interview with a man named Oz Guinness, who's a famous evangelical of the 20th century, and he's getting older, and the interview is just to talk about the very interesting life that he's had and all the types of things that he's gotten to do and see. Um, he's born to missionary parents in China uh, during World War II. Uh, his, his two other siblings starved to, starved to death in the famine that would come from the Japanese taking over the city in which he, le he lived. His parents got him out, and he was educated in England. And uh, one of the things he got to do that was just fascinating was he got to go spend four years at Labrie in Switzerland with Francis Schaeffer. For those of you all who don't know who Francis Schaeffer was, he was an unbelievable apologist um, and uh, a life led, a restful life led, um, doing everything that he could for Christ, for all the broken and bruised reeds of this world. And he, he said... People tended to think one thing about Francis Schaeffer because he wrote apologetics and so that he would be a harsh man, that he would be a hard man because he's always trying to defend, defend, defend. But he, he said that how many times he would sit there and watch as someone whose life was a complete and utter mess, whether it be just from drugs or just from just sin in general, and they would come and they would sit down across from Francis Schaeffer in his living room and he would just say to him, he just say, tell me your story. And as they would tell their story and how it is that their life was an absolute disaster and how they had gotten to the place where they were, he said every single time Francis Schaeffer's eyes would be welling up with tears as he is hearing of their story. He understood the pain that they went through and he wanted to show them mercy. He wasn't interested in hearing their story so he could rub it back in their face. He was interested in hearing their story. It overwhelmed him with the type of mercy that God had shown to them, to him, and now that he owed to this person. And he said it was because of this genuine, merciful empathy that he had in him that God worked thousands of salvations through these, just these individual one-on-one -on -one encounters that he would spend with people all the time. Francis Schaeffer could only give of his time, could only take these individual encounters, could only feel what he felt if he knew that his identity was secure in Christ. If he knew that he existed to show mercy, to lift other sheep out of the pit because he himself had been lifted out. Because he knows that Sabbath rest, that which brings an end to all these objectives that we seek that leave us empty, hollow, broken down, and destroyed is to go after bruised reeds and smoldering wicks. And we can only do this when we see what it is that Jesus has earned for us and given freely to us so that we ourselves can go live a life for others and do the same. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have been merciful to us and that we can have rest in you. That, Lord, that this life can beat us down. It can wear us out. It can leave us feeling beaten down, hopeless. And it's, Lord, it's not even when we haven't completed the objective. There's sometimes, Lord, is nothing worse in this life than to attain the very objective that we have sought for so long to find out that it does not bring us any peace. 
Lord, open our eyes. Let us see clearly that it is in your son that our identity is found, that we don't have to fight to prove other people wrong, to show other people that we're better, to, to, to do anything because, Lord, your son has done it all for us and so that we can let go and we can be at peace and we can live a life that is given away to others, that, that shows mercy, that desires to see others brought into your fold. So, Lord, have us as we get ready to prepare to respond, and as we prepare to leave this day, have us, Lord, to go seek bruised reeds, smoldering wicks. Lord, may we go out into this world and show mercy so that others may have rest in you. And Lord, may we understand fully, deeply, clearly all that you have done for us to guarantee us this right until we see you face to face. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.